So there are four sections of people from different periods of history, biblical history, and each period has a specific doctrinal principle about faith, what we call the faith cycle. Now, the one in the antediluvian period is found in verse 6, and so I want to read that. And a lot of sermons are preached for this, and, and, and probably if there's one verse out of chapter 11 that you would, that you would be familiar with and, and probably might quote would be verse 6, without faith. It's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And that's a doctrinal principle in a specific period. So we're going to look at that tonight. What is the writer trying to tell us there by interrupting a discussion he, he talks about Abel, he talks about Enoch, and then he stops and he interjects this, this doctrinal principle, and then he goes to Noah. So that's kind of interesting. It's interesting because in the 10 generation listed in Genesis 5, there are two more people between, Enoch is the seventh of the 10, and Noah is the 10th, and there are two people between them, and he doesn't mention them. Instead of them, instead of mentioning Methuselah and Lamit, he gives Hebrews 11.6 in their place. That's kind of interesting. And so we'll talk about that and why he did that and what was his point and why should we walk away with that point. All right, so let's have a word of prayer. Bible's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't live it nor learn it. In carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude kind of sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. What do you do? Well, you have to confess them to God. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That's the work of Christ from the cross to the believer's life to restore fellowship in the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. So I give you a moment to do that through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2, 5, and 9, and then we'll study. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight that we have an enormous privilege from the work of Christ on the cross to the believer's life in confession of sin, not to restore our relationship of salvation, but the fellowship, the spiritual fellowship that we have with God and one another. Ministry of the Holy Spirit is the key to the new covenant spirituality and a, and a very important part of our life, for sure. And carnality, the personal sin to gratify some sort of pleasure in our life hinders that. We don't have to get saved again, but we do have to confess our sin that has separated us from fellowship with the Father. We're thankful for that. Pray that both those who have come by automobile and those who are attending by the Internet would do that before we study so that the Holy Spirit could exercise one of his ministries of John 14, 26 to teach and to recall the Word of God through the faith cycle system. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, notice at the top of your paper, when you read through Hebrews 11, you'll find that the writer in, in the names of the people, starting with verse 4 and going through 40, when he lists people by name, when you study the names and the history from which they came from, you find that he grouped four groups. He put all these names, they, they, he grouped them. And we're looking at the antediluvian period tonight uh, in Hebrews 11, 4 through 7. The second group was a patriarch, he did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, if you recall. That's in Hebrews 11, 8 through 22. When you look through your Bible, you will see those names. Third group was Jewish, the Jewish period. He did two groups in there in the Jewish period uh, in, through verses 23 through 38. And the final group is church age, which he talks about in verse 39 and 40. Last time I was 
talking about this. I started talking about a medley relay race, and I looked around. I didn't think anybody would get it, so I dropped the idea, although I thought it was a good idea, but I thought, what, what, what good would it be if I talk about a race that nobody understands? That involves a baton and four runners. And then Rick thought it was a good one, and so Rick picked it up and completed the whole discussion and did a very good job with it. But I thought it was a good illustration. I ran the medley relay when I was in high school. And uh, I'll tell you, no matter how fast you are, you better not drop that baton, <laughs> no matter how fast you are. And uh, But, you know, you have one that goes out the first stretch, and then you have two shorter runners, and then you have the guy who follows up and takes it across the line. And uh, I thought that when I saw these four from group one to group two, what they do? They pass the baton. And from group two to three, they pass the baton. And from three to four, they pass the baton. That's how it got to us. And so I thought that was a. But anyhow, when you study the life of Paul in the Bible, you find that Paul was an enthusiast about races. And uh, of course, he grew up in a Greek culture of the, of the Greek Olympics. And, but it doesn't take you long studying Paul that you realize that he was really intrigued by runners, by runners. For example, in 1 Corinthians 9.24, it says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? <laughs> well, if you run, you do. <coughs> and then later, uh, he talks in 2 Timothy 4.7 about, I have finished the course or the race. So he was somebody that was knowledgeable about running uh, athletically and, and looking for prizes. You know, in other words, like our Olympic Games, we run for the gold, the silver, and bronze and such. And so he was, he was very knowledgeable, at least in the field of Greek uh, Olympic sports on a local level probably. Last week, we learned that the rider... What's interesting to us in my study is last week we learned that the writer gave a specific doctrinal principle in each grouping regarding the phase cycle. And so we're looking at the one he gave in the first group, the antediluvian period, in Hebrews 11.6. And these, this is going to be where I'm going to take you in our studies once you understand the faith cycle, now what he's doing is he's adding meat to the discussion or the study. We're going to look at four things today about Hebrews 11.6 that we might see a doctrinal principle about the faith cycle. Now let me remind you just briefly what the faith cycle is. You got hearing to believing, going clockwise, to applying to completing, and then back to the circle. Over here, you got completing. For hearing, a key passage is Romans 10, 17 that says, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. And Hebrew, and believing, once you hear it, you understand it, and you believe it, believing, that's a Hebrews 4.2 that says once you hear it, you have to understand it, then you must believe it in order for it to be ready to be applied to your life. And so this is applying it, applying the word you heard and believe, now it's ready for application. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Over here in completing, this, is a, this of course is the key. You know, if you as a runner, this is, getting to the finish line. And what is important about this is found in James 2.22. And what you learn about the faith cycle, and that's the faith cycle, that there are two sides to it. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, this side, and the conviction of things not seen, this side. Okay? You, 
the conviction of that what God has promised, and here's a key verse, Romans 4, 21. Now, you need to learn that cycle. Romans 4, 21 says that on this side, whatever God has promised you on this side, he is faithful and able to complete it on this side. And that is the faith cycle. This is how faith works in your life mechanically. And that's really important you understand that. And what the writer did in Hebrews 11, 1, is didn't give you a definition of faith. He gave you the mechanics, the assurance side and the conviction side. Hebrews 11, 1 is not a definition of faith. It's a definition of the mechanics of faith. And then he goes in and, and lists all these people and shows episodes from their life to show you that. Mechanics. Well, <clears throat> one of the things that he does in each group is he drops off an important doctrinal principle about the faith cycle. And so what he's going to do in Hebrews 11, he's going to give you four of them. How many groups do we have? We have four groups. He's going to give it, and I, I showed you, you can read ahead of time the doctrinal principles that I'm going to teach you about. You see, they're, they're listed there for you. Next time we come, it'll be Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, and yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> now, notice my title. My title for my message tonight and the doctrinal principle that he wants you to understand about the faith cycle. And this is a faith. Now, the, whatever this principle is, it's going to work in every group because the faith cycle worked both in the Old Testament and New Testament, you know. That's lesson one and two. We're in lesson three. We're in lesson, I guess, may, are we in lesson? Yeah, probably lesson three. I think we're in lesson three. Um, yes. you have it on there. Do I? Uh, okay. <laughs> Just in case I forget. Yes. Uh, <laughs> self-evident truth of the, the self-evident truth of the faith cycle. Self-evident truth of the faith cycle. You got that? Now, it's found in one interesting Greek word, which we'll discuss in a moment. The whole idea is bound up in a Greek word, which probably doesn't surprise you. But here's my first point of four. Now, remember, this comes out of the antediluvian period. It's one principle. He's going to give you a principle out of all four periods. That'll be important to you. The writer picked three out of 10 spiritual mature believers to present the importance of consistency of the faith cycle in our life, in the life of a believer. Now, what is of interest? He picked three out of 10. Now, if you go, listen to me, look up here. If you go to Genesis 5, you will find the five listed. If you, I mean the 10. If you're looking, if you want to know where you can find, well, wh what are the 10? You'd go to Genesis 5, and you can find them. Okay? Now, what's going to be interesting when you go there, they're all going to start with Adam. They're all going to start with Adam in Genesis 5. Now, watch this. And they're all going to go to Seth. All the genealogies of the seed of Christ are going to go, and it doesn't matter whether we're looking in Genesis 5 or we're looking in Luke, the third chapter, where they're both located. They're all going to go from Adam to Seth. But the writer didn't start with Seth. It started with Abel. Now, why do you do that? Because he's not... He's not going to write about the Messianic seed. This is not his purpose in listing all of these. His purpose is not running down any historical Messianic seed or anything like that. Rather to teach the faith, the principle of the faith cycle out of the life of a believer. Are you listening? He didn't start with Seth. Here, what happened? Adam had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel, and Abel got excommunicated. 
And it, they had a, a third son, and his name was Seth, and he became the Messianic seed bearer. That's the story behind the story. But the writer didn't do that because that's not his purpose or his point in this subject of, of, of Hebrews 11, right? And so it makes it very clear that that's not what his purpose is. He is not pushing the Christ part of this. He's pushing the faith part of it. Now, is Christ important? Of course, all these people are believers. You can't get saved without believing that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. In the Old Testament, it was prophetic gospel. In the New Covenant, it's historical gospel, right? Of course we know that. Of course we know that. Now, maybe some people on the Internet don't, but of course you know that. That's, that's a, a basic foundational principle. So here's what he does. He only lists three of ten, and he starts with Abel. And then he jumps to Enoch, which is the seventh. In the list of Genesis 5, he's the seventh from Adam, and Noah's the tenth, the last. How do we know? Well, he's the guy who captained the ship when the world drowned. Agreed? Noah's flood. The world drowned. He was the captain. Well, actually, God was, I suppose, the captain of the ship. Uh, he, he's, I don't know what you are under the captain, but that's whoever he would have been. I was an Army guy, so I don't know how all that works in the Navy. I don't know how all that works in the Navy. Three out of the ten, he lists three out of ten spiritual mature believers to present the importance of the consistency of faith. That's why he started with Abel. You know what Abel was? Listen to me now. To this writer, let me tell you who Abel was. He was a martyr of his faith. He was a martyr of his faith. He died for the cause of Christ. You do know that in his offering. His brother killed him with a sacrificial knife. Oh, well, he killed him. You know, if people want to commit murder, you don't have to have a gun, do you? First murder in the Bible was with a knife. A bullet just goes farther. You have to be really pretty good to hit somebody 100 yards away with a knife. You got to be a pretty good thrower, don't you? Well, the first believer introduced was Abel, and he wasn't Seth, as I said, this is a clue that we're not dealing with genealogy of Christ here. The emphasis is not that. The emphasis is rather mechanics of the faith cycle introduced to us in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, I put the faith cycle. Did I put it on your paper? Yes. I spoil you people. Thank you. I wrote it on the board because I, did, I didn't remember I put it on the paper. Thank you. That's all right. Look, you pay me these big dollars to do all this for you, and I'm going to do it. <laughs> Note where the writer, what is important in every one of these groups is where the writer puts the doctrinal principle. Right? Yeah. Why? I, maybe by the end of this study you'll say right. But anyhow, note where the writer placed the doctrinal principle of the faith cycle in the antediluvian period. He placed it between Enoch and Noah. Enoch was the seventh, so there's two more people between Enoch and Noah that he doesn't mention. Methuselah and Lamech, who was the father of Noah. Instead of putting those two guys in, now listen to me, instead of putting those two guys in, he put Hebrews 11.6. He took them out and put Hebrews 11, 6 in. Now, these were, listen, these were pretty strong people. So, Methuselah, his name, I wrote it on your paper, Methuselah, his name, listen to this, his name means when he dies, it will be sent. He's talking about the flood. The flood will come. And listen, when you you know why you, you know Methuselah was the oldest man recorded in the Bible. You know that. 
He lived 969 years. And do you know what? You can do the math in the Bible. And I will be teaching Genesis, the creation story, and going through some of this. When you add up his life, you will see that the day he died, the rain came. I mean, right on schedule. Right on schedule. When he died, his name said, when he dies, the flood will come. It will be sent. That's really important. Names in the Hebrew are very important to the story of the men or women. Now, 2 Peter 3, 9. This is why Methuselah is important, but he's not mentioned. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says God is not willing that any should perish. God is not willing that any man perish, die and go to hell. It's what perishes ideas. But that all come to repent it. Come to change their attitude and view about Christ, that he came to die for their sins, be buried and raised from the dead to give them everlasting life. Christ went to prepare a place for you when he went to heaven. He went to heaven not only to sit on the throne for God, but to prepare a place for you and for me, for the believer. That's John 14, by the way. Methuselah, in his period, testified by his length of life by his name. See, everybody Hebrew knew that his name meant when he dies, it will come. It will be sent. It will, it will come. But they didn't know what they were. It didn't what. But Noah, Enoch and Noah were two men who walked with God and preached the coming of God's judgment and it was called ministering, listen to me, this is important, ministering in the last days. The last days. You, when we get into Genesis later in the year, you will learn that the last days of the Antediluvian period began about the fifth generation. Enoch comes along in the seventh and he and Noah are two men that are declared walked with God. They both preached the message of righteousness over unrighteousness, godliness over ungodliness, and they were known as preachers of the coming of judgment. And they were both known as men who preached in the last days. And, of course, Noah, Noah was that preacher of the last days. Lamech, the name Lamech, the other person is not mentioned, but there is a space in there. Lamech, who is, the father, who is number nine in the genealogy, his name means strong or victor, overcomer. That's a very important title in the church age, to be strong and victorious, to be a victor and not a victim, to be an overcomer. You can read about this in Romans 15, 1, and I would encourage you to do that in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and 10. But I want you to look at a passage. I always, I always talk about salvation with you and I talk about Ephesians. So go to Ephesians in your book, if you would, to the second chapter. You're familiar with this if you've been around here any length of time. If not, we'll make you familiar with the Internet, people. It's a great message on salvation. Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. That's called the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. In Romans 1, 16, it says the gospel... Is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes. Now listen to what Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. I'm going to include 10. He says, 
in verse 8, for by grace you have been saved. That's the 100% the work of God and 0% the work of man. Through faith. Faith in what? Faith always has to have a working object. Faith in the gospel of Christ. The gospel is the power of God to save you. Through faith in the gospel. And that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Not as a result of works that no one should boast. Now watch verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Grace allows us in salvation to become his workmanship. We don't create God. God creates us. Look, we are his workmanship created how? In Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. We are God's workmanship. How did we become that title? How did that title become us? How did we get that? that? That's a title of who we are. Look again. For we are his workmanship. That's, that's a product of his grace salvation. We, that's a title. That's a positional title. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Watch this. For what reason? For, for good works. What is he talking about? He's talking about divine production. The workmanship is, is, uh, is your responsibility to understand that what God produces you is by, gr is by grace through faith. Where does faith come from? Hearing, hearing the word of God. That's where it comes from. It don't come from anyone. It doesn't come from a rooster crowing. It doesn't come from, you know, a dog barking. Ron, I love uh, workmanship. It's the Greek word poema where you get the word poetry. Yeah. He's making rhyme and reason out of our life. That's right. Out of your productive life. Yeah. Yes. Workmanship for good works. That's God doing it. Well, a workman... A workman of God creating Christ Jesus and one who understands that his produce that he produces, everything he produces from his life is 100% grace by faith. And that of herself, it's not, a, it has nothing to do with you in salvation. It has nothing to do with you in your Christian life. And it has nothing to do when you die and go to heaven. And how do you know where you're going? How Nobody knows where heaven is except up, and it depends on where you are on the earth what up is. <laughs> right? What up, yeah. What up? For good works, we're workmanship for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should what? Walk in them. That's an interesting idea that is apropos to where we are today in our study when he says Hebrews 11 6 okay Enoch the seventh the word the name Enoch the name Enoch means dedication and here's what the writer is saying by him he picked him because he means dedicated to the faith cycle dedicated to faith dedicated not by it dedicated to it not dedicated by it, but dedicated to it. And the word Noah means rest. Rest. Okay? Means rest. Now, and we'll talk about it in a moment. Now, what the writer does, he takes these two men out, what had enormous part in history. He takes them out. And he substitutes in their place Hebrews 11.6. He took number 8 and number 9 out and put Hebrews 11.6 in their place. Do you understand that? Now, they were all part of the last days and great ministry. But he's wanting to make a point. He's wanting to make a point. And here's his point. Without faith... The word it is, is 
is about brackets around it on your paper. Do you see the brackets? Yes. It's not actually in the Greek text. Without faith, impossible to please the word him is not in the Greek text. See, they put it in English just so it makes sense to you as you read it. Because the him is God. For he, the believer, who the person who comes to God, must believe that he is and, the word that is not in the Greek text. It's understood, but it's not there. He must believe that he is and he is, the word is, actually is not the word is, it's the word becomes. It is the word becomes. And if you had a Greek Bible tonight, you would see that the word is genomai, and it means to become. The word is, is aimi. And it, anybody can see the difference in these two words. Just like in the English, if you write two different words on the board, you can see it. The word is, is aimi, is, and the word genomai has many meanings. One of them is not is, but genomai means to become. This is the word, this is the word become, become, becomes. This is the word is. And it's an absolute status quo verb of existence. And we always tell our Greek students that go to our school here, we always tell them that an, is is always an absolute status quo verb in the Bible. And it always refers back to the essence of who God is. When, when he says, uh, God says, I am that I am. That's what he used is whether it's in the Hebrew, haya, or it's in the English, aimi. Okay? Just to give you an idea of what's going on in this text, it's an it's a unusual written Greek text. Let me show you just a little bit of the unusualness of it. For example, the Greek word for without in your Bible when it says, and without, see that on your paper or in your Bible, and without? It's an unusual preposition, unusual. We call it rare or unusual. And it's C-H-O-R-I-S. And the way we write that out in the, in the Greek is we go C-H-O when we put a line above it because that's an omega, R-I-S. That's an omega. That's a long O. Chloris. Okay? This word is unusual. You don't see this word a lot. But here's what's strange. It's used a lot. It's used a lot, although it's not used a lot in the New Testament. It's used a lot in the book of Hebrews. <laughs> the writer really loved this word without. We... Weiss is a, a great Greek theologian, a master, long dead, but a real master of the Greek language. Everybody that came up through the Greek language when I came up to it, through it, they read this man a lot. A lot. Weiss introduces Clovis as an axiomatic truth. He says that this, the reason that a writer used that unusual Greek preposition without is because he was using it axiomatic. Axiomatic is where, what, where you get self-evident truth. That's self-evident truth. Okay, and what the writer did with that is talk about the self-evident truth of the faith cycle. That's what Hebrews eleven six is all about. And without faith, say that's the faith cycle. There's not there's not a definite article with it. 
He's talking about mechanics, just like Hebrews 11.1. 1. He's talking about mechanics. He's talking about it through the whole chapter. Without faith, without faith, it's, an imp it's impossible to please. Hey, buddy. It's impossible, he says. It's impossible. Grab your sheet right there, big boy. There you go. And we're at point two. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. The word clois is used, and it's a rare, unusual preposition. It's used here, but it's used by the writer quite a bit in the book of Hebrews. But it's used here for self-evident truth of the faith cycle. Without faith, pistas. Without faith, and he's talking about the cycle or the mechanics like Hebrews 11.1. 1. Without faith, it is, is not there. there. It's not there. But you see, it's hard to say without impossible, right? It's hard to say that. And people go like, are you stuttering? What's wrong with you? Without faith, impossible to please God. All right? And so you have to substitute in there to have a flow. But it's actually not there. And listen, when the Greek, Greeks know how to write stuff, God certainly, this is his book, he certainly knows how to write. When you leave stuff like this out, it forces you to go like, what's, he, what, 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 what's going on here? Right? He left, a, he left a verbal structure out of it. So what are you going to do with that? Point three. Here's what we're going to do with it. The Greek grammar is going to help us understand the doctrinal principle of self-evident truth of the faith cycle. Stated in Hebrews 11.6. And I've got to break it down into four points so you to see it. The first point is the word to please. This is a subject. This is the subject. It's an aorist infinitive. An aorist infinitive establishes an absolute fact. That's what an aorist infinitive does. An infinitive is where you get to, to please. The Greek word that's used for please, we'll talk about a little later, but I'll give it to you. It's a compound word that means well-pleased. 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 Not just pleased, well-pleased. The word to please is an aorist infinitive used as a subject working with the main verb which is all the way down to he is. The, see the first he is? In Hebrews 11, look, it's, at, it's, up, it's up under point, point two. Look up there. And without faith, impossible to please, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. See the he is? That's the verb. The verb is all the way down there. It is not a it is. It's a what? It's a he is. There's no it in this. He is. The verb is a he is. Just trying to tell you how it is. How it is. To please is the subject working with the main verb he is, I me, and with... The word impossible, I gave it to you. It has the alpha privative on the front of that word. <laughs> See the A on the front of that word? That's an alpha privative that gives it a negative, not, or M, impossible. With the impossible, which is a predicate adjective, it's a predicate adjective. So here's the idea. You can't see it in the English. So here's the idea. It is not 
impossible to please God as long as the faith cycle functions properly. That's the point. How about that? It's not impossible. It's not, it's on the paper. The idea, it is not impossible. It's not impossible to please God. You understand? Well, I don't know how I could ever please God. Well, it's not impossible to please him. But, you see, but, you see, as long as the faith cycle functions properly. That's the whole subject of chapter 11. That's all he's talking about. And he uses illustration after illustration out of people's life to show it to you. Abel shows it to you. Enoch shows it to you. Noah shows it to you. And the list goes on. In fact, the list is so long, he just lumps the last group into a whole bunch of pe names of people that you're going to have to go study on your own, like I tell you. Look, you're going to have to go home and study that. Now, here's what's important. He gives you the first to please without faith. It's impossible to please. Then he gives you three additional points on this. What are we talking about? Listen to me now. Look. <laughs> I wish I didn't have to put you through all this. All right. But you're going to have to put your thinking cap on. I mean, this is not kindergarten now. So you're going to have to put your thinking cap on. You're going to have to pay attention because it's not kindergarten. But you can learn this. And if you want to know what Hebrews is talking, if you want to know, if you want to know what Hebrews 11 talked about, you're going to have to put your thinking cap on because this is how he talks. If you think I'm nuts about this, this is the way the guy talks. So here's the first point. The first point is on your paper, without faith, it's impossible, impossible to please God. Okay, that's the idea. Now he got, he's got three more points. So here's the second point. Look up there at, your, uh, at what we wrote out on Hebrews 11.3. As, as under point two, one, two, three, it's in the third paragraph. Four, explain. Now, I, he says, let me explain. Four. He said, and so he, he comes up with kind of, kind of difficult thing. But listen, you get the point without faith, it's impossible to please him, right? I mean, you get that point, the point's there. And then he, then he comes to, the, uh, let me explain what I'm talking about, he says. He who comes to God must believe. That's the second point. Now watch. He who comes, see the word ton, T-O-N, that's ton, that's a definite, that's he who, that's he who, it's a definite article with a, of a participle, we call it an articulate participle, it is the, that's how you know it's he who, plus echo my is in the present middle participle, the present tense, now listen to me. This is not a person who comes one time. This is a person who comes all the time. The present tense is continuous action. This is not an aorist tense. He's not talking about the person who comes to salvation. He's talking about the believer who comes to God all the time because that's the only way faith works. Because, listen... For by grace are you saved through what? Faith. Faith activates grace. Grace is God doing it. You, you hear the gospel, you believe the gospel, and God gives you salvation for time and eternity. See, this is a present tense. It's continuous action. So here's the point. For the believer who comes continuously, the, 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 
the middle voice, this is a deponent verb. It ends in O-M-A-I. It's a historical truth. See the O-M-A-I? That means that's a deponent verb in the Greek. It means it's historical. This is a historical idea. Not a hysterical one, a historical one. And it's a participle. It's a participle, and that'll be important to you in a moment. For the believer who continuously comes to God, a definite article with God, to God, must. This word must is dia, and it's a present imperative. This word is unique because this is not debatable. And that's the word dia, D-E-I. This is not debatable. This is not a, I'm not asking would you like to. I'm telling you, this is how faith works. Here's the second point of faith. You must always come to God. Because the whole thing is about grace. It, faith does not work without grace, and grace doesn't work without God. So the believer must always come, be, come to God to have things work out in their life that they can't work out and never could on their own. The one who comes to God on a continuous basis, because this is how it faith, this is how it properly, this is how the faith cycle properly works, right? Properly works. The believer must learn that he must always come to God and that when he comes to God with a situation in his life, all these people had issues in their life like you do. What are you going to do with them? You can sit around, pull your hair out and fret and worry and get full of anxiety. No, he says, come to God. Always bring it to God. This is a 1 Peter 5, uh, 6 through 8 kind of idea. Put your burdens on Christ because he's a burden-carrying Savior. He don't ask you to carry him. He asks you to let him carry him. I mean, what sweetheart, if he's trying to impress his girlfriend, doesn't carry her books to class? Here, baby, let me carry those books for you. All right? And everybody knows that she could very well be taken because the big boy's carrying her books. Everybody's going, hey, better step back, step back. No, you better step back away from that. So we need to learn that. He says, so for, explain, let me explain, the believer must come to God on a continuous basis. He must believe. When he comes to God and gives it down and God says, well, here's the answer, what's the Bible say? See, God believes something. See, believe is the action of faith. Uh, uh, see, faith comes by believing. When you believe it, you have faith. When you apply it, faith is working on what you believe. Where did you get it? Hearing comes from the Word of God, right? Where does faith come from? It comes from hearing the Word of God. I understand it. I believe it. Once I believe it, that faith is now ready for application because it understands it will be applied because we believe God will do what he's promised, Romans 4.21. What God has promised, he is able to carry it to the completion. That's what the writer is saying here. What the writer is saying, for he must come on a continuous, present tense, on a continuous basis, this is a divine principle, participle, this is a divine truth or a point of mechanics, he must believe, and watch, the word believe, I know, I know you're, you don't have to pull your hair out tonight so you can relax. The rest of us are pulling our hair out. Right? The rest of us are pulling our hair out. Listen to me now, this is important. I know it'll be, for, for William, he's got to hear it 10 more times, so we're just introducing him to it. I'm down to eight. Eight, eight. Okay, <laughs> he's down to eight. Now watch, the word belief, pastuo, watch this now, is an aorist infinitive. It's the second one we have. 
Notice the first one is under point, point, the first point. To please. That's an aorist infinitive. What did I tell you an aorist infinitive does? An aorist infinitive establishes an absolute fact. You know, you never get anything absolute from the world. Everything is a relativity. Yeah. You know where you get absolute truth? From the word of God. Absolutely. That's where you get it. And the aorist infinitive, when it's put together in something, it always points to an absolute fact. Just remember that, because there are a lot of aorist infinitives in the Bible. And we have two here. We have the first point is an aorist infinitive, to please, right? Impossible, to please, right? With that whole situation. The second time he comes back, he uses the aorist imperative that the believer, in explaining this, he says the believer must continually come to God, and when he gets the directive will from God about his problem, he must believe, right? He must believe. It's an essential point. He must believe, and he puts an aorist infinitive, an absolute fact that what God has promised, this is a Romans 4.21, what God has promised you, he is willing and able to complete it. He's obligated. Listen to me. The moment you believe what God tells you to be the truth, God obligates himself to you to bring it to completion in your life. He obligates himself to you. That's why it's important to go from the hearing of faith to the believing side, because once you believe it, God has sealed you up in that deal. That's a deal that God will see you through on. See, that's Romans 4.21. Now, there's a third point to this. So, what are we talking about? The great principle here is self-evident truth of the faith cycle. You know who's going to get to self-evident truth. When you begin to put these four points together under self-evident, what he's going to do is going to reveal to you the self-evident truth that God is true to his word. When you believe it, when you hear it, believe it, and apply it, God will do it. And he's going to make you a believer out of it. That's self-evident truth of the faith cycle. He will prove it to you every day of your life. Every time you come to him, lay it out to him, he gives you the answer. Now you, you hear it, you believe it, you apply it, he completes it, and boy, you're off to the races because that's the way it works. Here's, third, here's the third point in the self-evidence of the truth of the faith cycle. That, the word that, that you, the first that that you see in the English text of Hebrews 11, 6, the first one you see is hote. It's a declarative conjunction in the Greek language. It's declaring to something. He's saying, I declare to you, right? I declare to you, watch what he does, that he, God, is absolute status quo verb of existence, that God is, that God exists, and he exists to be a father to you, to train you and teach you to walk by faith so that he can fulfill every promise that he has for your life. Now think about that. God has more promises if you live a hundred lifetimes, he would still have more promises for you. You should never let one day go by that you don't reach up into that bag of promises and pull one out and watch God work magical, wonderful, powerful things in your life. I couldn't imagine going through a day without reaching in that goodie bag. That's what gets me up every morning, puts fire in me. Where's that goodie bag, Father? Mm, let me reach in there and get something out because I know something good's going to come today because I reached in the goodie bag. That's Romans 8.28. That goodie bag is Romans 8.28, right? Nah, that's the goodie bag. That he is absolute status quo. Well, watch this. This is really important. That's a present active indicative. That's a... The P-A-I is present active and negative. You know what the present tense means? Continuous action. Now, the last time you saw it was right above. 
He who comes, present participle. See that? He is, is in the present tense. He tells you, how, how, how much, listen, he tells you to come to him how much, how often? Continuously. Right? He tells you to do it continuously because he is there for you on a continuous basis. See that? He is. You come because he is. You come in the present tense because he is in the present tense. He's not a God of yesterday. He's a God of yesterday, today, and what? Forever or tomorrow. Right? He's in your yesterdays, he's in your todays, and he's in your tomorrows. So you live in the present. You should anyhow. Live in the present in continuous. Come to him because he's ready for you to come. He stands on ready. He's got the goodie bag. He is. You know what he's talking about? Not just that he is in the presence, always present for your life. He's a good father. Right? He's not just a holy father. He's a good one. He's your daddy. He's got the goodie bags for your life. All the things you wonder, well, what, where will I go to school? Who will I marry? What will this be? What will that be? All in that goodie bag. Got them all. Got your whole life wrapped up. Now, he is, and listen, here's what's important. When you get to absolute stat, status quo, I mean, I mean, is the absolute status quo verb of existence. When you get to that, then you've got to go to the essence of God. Right? Well, who is God that he could do this for me? Well, he's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's, uh, he's omnipresent. And, he, you know, that whole list, he's, he's veracity. He's immutable. He's sovereign. He's righteous. He's love. He's eternal life. He's holy. He's all of these things. I mean, just think about this. This God is ready. You come to him with a problem. You think is, boy, this is a big deal. He says, okay, let's talk about it. He gives you a word on it. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, teach and recall. He gives you a word on it. He said, well, here, here's the word that you have in your soul. He's not giving you a word that you don't have in your soul. Here's the word in your soul for you to bring up that he is. And you go like, well, it's so big, I don't know what it is. He goes like, look, just calm down. Reach in a goodie bag and get it because what I promise I'll do. See, always remember, son, Romans 4.21, what I promised I will do. I'm not going to shortchange you. I'm always going to overchange. I'm never going to be underchange. And just think, when you think that what you're facing is bigger than life itself, and how would I ever get from this point to that point, he goes like, well, you know, I, I, I am that I am. Well, who are you, God? Well, I'm omnipotent. What do you mean by that, Father? I mean, I'm all-powerful. I can, listen, I can move mountains without machinery <laughs> or without dynamite. The essence of God. He's saying, you, you have to understand, you, you, he who comes to me, must believe that he is. Not just one who promises, but one who performs what he promises. That's the faith cycle. Who's going to complete it? Who's going to complete the faith cycle? You hear it, you believe it, you apply it. Who completes it? God. God. Oh, this is so good. I'm telling you. Here's the fourth thing he says. Now watch this. And... See that word and? See where it says he, that he is and? The word that is not in that second part. The reason they put it in there, it's okay because the word chi, the word and, is an adjunctive conjunction. Now, I know. I have to tell you that because that's why I make these big dollars. But let me tell you what that means. Let me tell you what that means. And that, that's not there but understood, he is, watch this, see, get on my, that's the word becomes. It's not is. That's not the same word, I mean. It's a different word. It's get on my. 
Watch this now. That's a present active indicative. Now watch this. You're going to miss this. The reason that the word and is chi in the Greek is an adjunctive conjunction is because he has got to tie the, the, both these present active indicatives into one movement. Watch this. I know. You couldn't understand this without, without me. I'm serious. That's not boast. I'm just telling you. There's no way. Here's the word chi. It's an adjunctive. I wrote it down. It's an adjunctive conjunction. It ties this present active indicative here to this present active indicative here. Both are referring to God. Watch. The first one is what? I mean. Right? He is. And the second one about God is Ginomai becomes. It's not is and is. He is talking about who he is. The essence of God that's, that backs, the character of God backs everything he's promised and everything he'll do, he promised he'll do for you. He's not going to have a hard time doing it. And he will always be truthful and faithful, self-evident truth that God exists for you. God don't exist for himself. He exists for you. See, God can exist without us, but we can't exist without him. That's one of the truths that you can't learn in science. You have to learn it in the Bible. That's the law of creation. Now watch this. Do you see that he is and he becomes? Right? He's talking about God. You with me? All right. I'm going to tell you one more thing, if you can take it. If you can handle this. Look back up there to point number two, not my point two, but the writer under point three. He who comes, watch this now, he who comes. Now watch this. God, this is so good. This writer is really on top of his game. Watch this. He who comes to God, must believe that, right? Must believe. Right. Right? right? He must believe. Watch this now. He must believe this, and he must believe this. Right? right. <laughs> Watch this. See this right here? That's a present middle participle. On your paper, it's a present middle participle. This present and this present and that present are all tied up together. In the Greek language, the action of a present participle occurs at the same time as a present indicative. An indicative is a main verb. We have two main verbs connected with that participle. The believer who comes on a continuous basis to God will find that God is there ready and willing to help him and to complete what his struggle in his life is in the plan of God. All of that's tied up together. The action in the Greek language, a simple, a simple rule is the action of an heiress, the action of a present participle. You're looking for main verbs, and we have two of them that are in, 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 tied up with chi. That's a trailer hitch. It's an adjunctive <laughs> conjunction. <laughs> ah, you're brain dead. Ah, you're brain dead. Are you brain dead? No. Yes. What? Do I? No. 
So here's what I want you to do. I want you, now you're going to have to go home, William, and read this eight times at least. <laughs> Don't read them all at one day and say, I covered my eight. Read them eight days. What you need to do, this whole thing started to, to teach you a, a, a doctrinal principle of the faith cycle. It is the self-evident truth of the faith cycle in your life. And he says, look for these four ways that God will show it to you. Have you got it? Yeah. Better write it down because tomorrow you will forget what I said. You'll come back and I'll forget what I said. <laughs> we'll have to go back to this whole study where I can lead up to what I just said. One thing is to see how the faith cycle me mechanics works. I put that on the first page, right? Hearing, believing, applying, completing. Now listen, the faith cycle is a basic doctrine of the Christian faith. I know tonight I've made it kind of difficult. <laughs> okay, because I have to explain to you what the scriptures actually say because I'm a teacher. So I am obligated to God to explain it to the best of my ability, and it requires me to teach you a little bit of the Greek language. And I've taught it as simple as I know how to teach it. Now, there's probably people who could do it a lot simpler than me, but and please, here's the doctrine principle I want you to walk away with. The faith cycle has self-evident truth, and here are four ways you can find it in your life. <coughs> Right? I want you to get that. I want you to get that. Because the faith cycle is how you live. You live by faith, not by sight. And so let me conclude. Enoch dedicated to the faith cycle, and Noah rest by means of the faith cycle, and I gave you scripture for that, were spiritual mature, old covenant believers walking consistently by the faith cycle daily. They walked with God every day by faith. Walked with God every day by faith. And this is what it meant. They were spiritual mature believers who lived in the last days of the antediluvian civilization. The rainbow reminds us that there was once a civilization like that, right? Mm -hmm. Why is the rainbow there? To remind you that the flood took out the first world. You know what's going to take out your world? Fire. Fire. I actually said that Southern. Fire. I just... I heard that. Uh, far. far. I just said far. <laughs> yeah. I just said far. I don't know if I've ever said that. When I first came to South, I never could understand what people were saying. I didn't know if they said fire, fair. They were going to a fair. When I first came, I couldn't hear it. Now I speak it. I mean, how did that work? I heard myself say that. I'm so proud of myself, Mommy Ben. But people, if they were listening to my people, would go like, He's become so Southern. They were spiritual mature believers who preached the coming of the divine judgment. I put down some great scriptures for you to read about it. All right. So let's, let's close in a word of prayer. Either that or serve breakfast. I know. Oh, boy. Time flies when you're not having fun. Oh, I, I misquoted that. All right. Do I? That's your first misquote. That's my first misquote. Well, wouldn't that be good? If that was true, that'd be wonderful. All right, let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for these who have come our way to study with us the Word of God, both by the automobile and by the Internet. I know we were kind of technical tonight in the language, but, you know, it required it, I suppose, at least in my heart it did, uh, to kind of lay it out to show you how technical uh, but yet I, I want him to understand the simplicity of it, self-evident truth of the faith cycle. Look at, look, what do you look for? Point one, point two, point three, point four. That's what I want them to get. Uh, the rest of it, Father, was just a way to establish the principles for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.